I am pleased to welcome you uh, to the seventh and sadly the final panel of the annual McLean Center conference this year. Uh, the seventh panel is entitled Surgical Ethics. It's my honor to introduce this panel's moderator, Dr. Peter Angelos. Peter Angelos, MD, PhD, FACS, MAMSE, is the Linda Kohler Anderson Professor of Surgery and Surgical Ethics and is the Vice Chair for Ethics uh, and Professional Development and Wellness in the Department of Surgery, is the Chief of Endocrine Surgery and is the Associate Director of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics, all at the University of Chicago. A native of Plattsburgh, New York, where his father was a community general surgeon, uh, Peter Angelos completed his undergraduate degree medical school and PhD in philosophy at Boston University. He completed his residency in general surgery at Northwestern University and went on to complete fellowship in clinical medical ethics here at the University of Chicago and a fellowship in endocrine surgery at the University of Michigan. Dr. Angelos is a very busy endocrine surgeon who has written widely on improving outcomes of thyroid and parathyroid surgery, on minimally invasive endocrine surgery, and ethical aspects in the care of surgical patients. Dr. Angelos has published over 250 peer-reviewed articles and has authored or co-authored over 50 more book chapters. He edited two editions of the book, Ethical Issues in Cancer Patient Care, and is the co-editor of the American College of Surgery textbook entitled Ethical Issues in Surgical Care, and is co-editor of a forthcoming book entitled Difficult Decisions in Surgical Ethics. Dr. Angelos also was a regular contributor to the American College of Surgeons Surgery News, where he wrote a column on surgical ethics entitled The Right Choice from 2011 through 2019. He's a governor of the American College of Surgeons, a member of the Academy of Master Surgeon Educators of the American College of Surgeons, and is the past president of the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons. In June 2019, Dr. Angelos began a six-year term as a counselor of the American Board of Surgery. It's a delight to welcome Dr. Peter Angelos to serve as the moderator on this seventh panel entitled Surgical Ethics. Thank you, Mark, very much for that uh, really uh, very kind and uh, way too long introduction. Um, it is uh, a real honor for me to be moderating this uh, last uh, panel for the conference. Um, it's been a great conference. Uh, I uh, appreciate everyone who has uh, stuck it out till the end, um, but we've got a series of excellent talks. Uh, and I'm going to start um, by talking about the value of attending to the ethical dimension of the surgeon-patient relationship. Now, I have no disclosures with respect uh, to this presentation, um, but I do have a few disclaimers, and I think it's valuable to at least put them out there uh, at the outset. Um, first of all, when it comes to evidence uh, and ethics, it's a little bit harder to make the case um, and especially in things where it's a little bit harder to measure these things. And so um, most of what I'm going to uh, present to you is related to my opinion, um, and therefore I'm absolutely convinced it's true, but um, you may lack proof and that's okay, um, but hopefully it'll form uh, uh, some subject for discussion. Lastly, I do want to state that um, this uh, presentation, for this presentation, I have really focused on surgeons and the experience uh, of surgeons and my own personal experience as a surgeon. Now, I do not believe that that experience is uh, unique in uh, providing medical care. Um, and so I would challenge um, everyone listening who does not identify as a surgeon to see the ways in which there are similarities and differences between the things that I'm suggesting 
uh, with respect to surgery uh, and other areas of caregiving uh, in medicine. So uh, let me start with a sort of basic question, uh, why is it good to be ethical? Um, and certainly we know that there's an intrinsic value in acting ethically uh, as a surgeon and uh, as, a, uh, a, as a person. Um, but there's also, I would argue, an extrinsic value in acting ethically, um, and that is that patients benefit from ethical surgeons. Um, but what I'm going to also suggest is that surgeons also benefit from the attention to the ethical dimension of surgical care. And so in that sense, I'm going to be focusing a little bit more on what is the benefit to surgeons more so than what is the benefit to patients, although obviously what's beneficial for patients is equally, if not more important. So I'm going to talk a little bit about burnout. Um, and in this sense, I, I think I'll be um, perhaps following um, some of the similar vein that um, Bernie Lowe suggested in his excellent presentation about how you know the e tough ethical questions are the ones that keep us up at night, um, but they also help us find meaning in our work. And also some of the uh, comments that Far Curlin made about um, some of the methods to reduce burnout. Um, so we know that burnout's an important issue for surgeons as well as other caregivers. Um, and, you know, I think that's an open question whether there's an epidemic of burnout or rather there's just a greater awareness of the issue. Um, but either way, I think it demands attention. And we know it's a risk factor for depression and suicide. And estimates are that about 400 physicians per year commit suicide. So that's equivalent to one very large medical school class of physicians per year. So that's a huge um, and tragic loss. Now, there are a number of potential factors that are associated with surgeon burnout, and others have commented on these. Um, people suggest that a loss of autonomy is uh, significant, um, a diminished sense of value in our clinical activities. Some people have pointed to the electronic medical record as being um, adding to that problem. Uh, and some have even suggested that inclusive language may devalue individual physician contributions. And so, so the term provider, as opposed to the term my, my doctor or my, my surgeon, um, suggests that uh, a provider suggests a cog in the wheel rather than an essential actor. And so perhaps that has something to do with these increased feelings of burnout. Now, there are, of course, personal characteristics that have been discussed uh, to reduce the risks of burnout. Um, resilience, um, defined as the ability to bounce back from adversity, is thought to be an important factor. Um, capacity, um, the ability to bear the many unavoidable irritants of daily life with relative equanimity. These are, you know, valuable traits that um, seemingly would help people to reduce the risk of burnout. Um, and there are many others. I'm just going to highlight these two because I do think that um, they're interesting. Um, you know, it's this interest and this emphasis on these factors, for example, resilience, um, that uh, led to a number of interventions. Um, the University of Chicago has a whole resilience week. Um, and uh, I thought it was particularly impressive in, uh, in the winter of 2019. We had a whole series of resilience week lectures, presentations. These were for residents, faculty, other caregivers, students. Um, of course, if you remember, that was also uh, the time of the polar vortex in Chicago. So I thought it was with uh, tremendous irony that uh, Resilience Week was canceled due to extreme cold. Um, it seemed to be to suggest we have a lack of resilience. We're in Chicago anyway, but uh, nevertheless, I digress. Uh, so what about, um, are there aspects of surgical practice that could increase resistance to burnout. And 
I do believe that emphasizing the ethical dimension of the surgical care of patients that we provide may have benefit to surgeons as well as to our patients. Now, what is this ethical dimension of surgical care that I'm talking about? Well, it's the non-technical aspects of surgical care. And these are things like communication with patients. They are really focused on the surgeon-patient relationship um, and the importance of the trust that patients place on their surgeons. Uh, It is certainly um, intimately related to shared decision-making, which we've heard a lot about in the last um, couple days. Well, how might this attention to the ethical dimension affect surgeons? Uh, Well, I would say regardless of the practice setting, the individual relationship of surgeon and a patient is an intensely personal one. We can't, or at least I can't, have a relationship with just patients in general. I have a relationship with each individual patient um, separately. And in fact, every time we obtain informed consent for an operation, we are asking our patients to trust us individually. So I am specifically asking my patient to trust me to do things to them that are potentially uh, very harmful if it doesn't go well. And the responsibility to uphold our patient's trust is in fact a central motivator to surgical excellence. Um, And I would argue that it's even one of the motivators to um, continuing medical education in surgery, uh, the desire to keep up with the literature, et cetera. Now, what are the reasons why many chose to be surgeons? Now, this is non-scientific. I'm relating to you some aspects of my personal Uh, life as well as in talking with many friends and colleagues who are surgeons over the years. Um, I think it's the opportunity to use our individual skills and talents to aid another person in need of assistance. That's what really, um, I think, drives many. Um, And for many of us, the joy of surgery is in helping our patients. And regardless of how devalued we may feel in our jobs, For each individual patient who trusts us to lie down in the OR, we are highly valued. Now, how can we emphasize this ethical dimension in surgical care? Well, I think that there are a couple of things that would be helpful. First of all, we need to take seriously how well or how poorly we communicate with our patients. We need to emphasize the development of communication skills in optimal surgical education and practice. I think we also need to acknowledge the central role of trust in the surgeon-patient relationship. Now, we all know that there are things that we can control and things that we cannot control. Um, And lack of control we know is a major source of frustration that's felt by surgeons and lots of other physicians in large institutional practices today. We know that loss of control is intimately related to increases in the risk of burnout. Um, But I would suggest that in the privacy of the exam room, each interaction that we have with our patient is under the control of the surgeon. So I can't control what my patient's going to say, but I can certainly control a number of aspects of the way that I explain things, the extent to which I ensure that there's high-level communication, that I answer questions, that I spend the right amount of time, and that sort of thing. So I do think that we may have time pressures, but there's really no administrator who can affect how well or how poorly I engender my patient's trust. Now, I do think that we know that there's a tremendous impact of complications on surgeons. 
And multiple studies have pointed out the serious impact on surgeon well-being that complications have. Some have described the surgeon as the second victim of a complication. I'm not sure I like that characterization, but nevertheless, it's prevalent. Um, multiple institutions have sought to reduce this impact by peer counseling programs. And I think these are worthwhile interventions, um, but I also think that there's something more that we could do. And I, I think that focusing on the ethical dimension of surgical care also might help um, because by ensuring the adequacy of informed consent from our patients, we are actively engaging them in the decision-making process around their operation. And such shared decision-making acknowledges that the surgeon does not always know best and that complications can and do occur. And having had these conversations does not diminish the physical impact of a complication on a patient, but I do think it may reduce the psychological implications on both the patient and the surgeon. I do think that increasingly, we throughout medicine are faced with a dilemma. We are increasingly pushed to measure our outcomes and quantify results, and certainly that's valuable. We need to measure outcomes. We need to be very careful in how we do it, and we need to pay attention to it. Um, as Lord Kelvin said, um, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So there is definitely a value in measuring things so that we can improve them. Unfortunately, it's difficult to quantify ethical behavior, but we still need to encourage it. And Albert Einstein said it quite nicely, not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. So I'll leave you with just a few conclusions. First of all, I think it's good to be ethical. I think that there's both intrinsic and extrinsic value, and I wanna go on the record of being strongly in favor of ethical behavior. Secondly, I think attention to the ethical dimension of surgical care reduces the likelihood of surgeons being considered mere technicians. And I think this is absolutely critical for the future of the profession of surgery. I think that the emphasis on the relationships that surgeons have with their patients can reduce the risks of burnout. And by emphasizing the importance of patients' trust in surgeons, surgeons may be less likely to be negatively affected by complications when they occur. Both patients and surgeons, I believe, will benefit from the high levels of ethical care that surgeons provide by really paying attention to this ethical dimension and really fully encompassing the ethical dimension in what, what I would argue is really complete surgical care of our patients. Um, so with that, I wanna end and um, thank you for your attention. I also wanna thank specifically uh, Mark Siegler for his many years of friendship, mentorship, and guidance, uh, and for uh, inviting me to be part of the, uh, this great program today. So thank you. Um, it's now my privilege as the moderator of the session to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Julie Kaur, MD, PhD, is an associate professor of, of obstetrics and gynecology in the section of complex family planning and an assistant director of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics. After completing medical school at the University of Chicago's Pritzker School of Medicine, Dr. Kaur completed her obstetrics and gynecology residency, fellowship in family planning, and an MPH at the University of Illinois at Chicago. A dedicated educator, Dr. Kaur serves as the program director for the Fellowship in Complex Family Planning, assistant director for the MS3 Obstetrics and Gynecology Clerkship, and co-director for the Pritzker School of Medicine's first-year doctor-patient relationship course. Her academic and clinical work focuses on understanding and addressing barriers that adolescents and young adults face in seeking and obtaining reproductive health care. She is the co-editor of the recently published book entitled Reproductive Ethics in Clinical Practice. So uh, welcome, Dr. Kaur. 
Thank you so much. Thanks, Julie. That was just uh, fantastic. And I, I do think uh, there are, it, it does seem to me that um, there are going to be some uh, wonderful themes emerging from these, this series of presentations. I know that several people have put in questions already, but for those of you who are thinking of them, please go ahead and put them in uh, so that they can uh, be uh, uh, ranked by uh, the other participants. Um, so it is a pleasure for me to introduce the, the next speaker, Dr. Norman Hogikian who's professor and associate chairman of otolaryngology head and neck surgery at the University of Michigan Medical School, professor of music in the UM School of Music, Theater, and Dance, and faculty in the University of Michigan Center for Bioethics and Social Sciences and Medicine. Uh, he serves as chief of the Division of Laryngology and General Otolaryngology, director of the University of Michigan Vocal Health Center, and faculty ethicist with the Michigan Medicine Clinical Ethics Service. Dr. Hogikian received his Bachelor of Science degree in Cellular and Molecular Biology from the University of Michigan, magna cum laude, and Phi Beta Kappa in 1982. He went on to graduate from the University of Michigan Medical School, uh, was AOA with distinction in research in 1988. While in medical school, he uh, received the Howard Hughes um, Medical Institute, National Institutes of Health Research Fellowship, spent a year at the NIH. He had a residency in otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at Wash U in St. Louis, um, and then a fellowship in laryngology um, at Loyola University of Chicago under Dr. Robert Bastian. Dr. Hogikian joined the University of Michigan faculty in 1995. He's a graduate of the Clinical Medical Ethics Fellowship at the University uh, at the McLean Center. Uh, his laryngologic research interests include measurement of voice-related quality of life, laryngeal paralysis, subglottic stenosis. Um, his ethics-related research interests include the doctor-patient relationship, trust in the surgeon-patient relationship, and ethical considerations for patients with communication disorders. Um, Dr. Hogikian will be speaking on trust and the surgeon-patient relationship today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Peter, for that very kind introduction. And uh, thank you to Dr. Siegler and the McLean Center for the opportunity to participate in this year's conference. I'm going to talk about trust. Uh, something that's important in any relationship is particularly important in the doctor-patient relationship. And, and my presentation is going to focus on how trust develops between a surgeon and their patient. I have no uh, relevant disclosures. And I'm going to start with some background material on, on trust and call it food for thought. Um, although I, I, I could have done no better job than, than Peter has already done with his presentation in getting us into a mindset thinking about trust. Uh, following that, uh, I'll present some of our own research on patient perceptions of how trust develops between a surgeon and a patient. And then I'll briefly touch on future directions. Pause for a moment and consider undergoing surgery by a surgeon you trust. Well, it's a stressful, anxious circumstance. There's uncertainty, there's vulnerability, but those things can be buffered by, by the guardrails of the trust that you have in your surgeon. Now pause and contemplate having surgery by a surgeon whom you've not had the opportunity to establish trust with or whom you do not trust. That's a completely different proposition, isn't it? Uh, a quick uh, true story from this week. Um, on Monday, I operated for a patient with a paralyzed vocal cord uh, doing an operation where we, we exposed the larynx and I actually drill an opening in the laryngeal cartilage in order to expose the underlying vocal fold and then adjust the position of it uh, in order to enhance the patient's voice. And this operation is necessarily done under local anesthesia with light sedation because we have to actually listen to the patient's voice in order to adjust the position. And so they're, they're awake, 
with their neck open uh, in the OR. The next morning, I was rounding on this patient, and I, I said to her, um, boy, I, I'm certain it must be a very difficult thing to participate in your own surgery like that, and, and thank you uh, for that. It, it, it's an important part of the outcome of this operation. And she said to me, you know, doc, Dr. Hogikian, I, I, I could feel my anxiety starting to well up uh, at several points in the operation because I, I could hear what was going on, and I was kind of picturing it in my mind. And it was the trust I had in you, her choice of words, it was the trust I had in you that allowed me to contain the anxiety during the surgery. Now reflect on the other side of that trusting relationship as a clinician upon how it feels to establish trust with a patient. Well, it, it feels pretty good, right? Uh, there's certainly a responsibility associated with that, but it feels good uh, to have that trusting relationship. Now reflect as a clinician or as a, you know, simply a human being on how it feels to not be trusted or to not have trust in someone else. It doesn't feel very good. I submit these two phrases to you, that the joy and meaning in being a physician are to be found in the doctor-patient relationship, and that trust and trustworthiness are critical elements of this relationship. Uh, this was an interesting paper from a few years back uh, that proposed foundational characteristics of being a physician. And in order to be foundational, they felt that the characteristics should be timeless and real yet aspirational. And by that, they meant that these aren't things that you ever finish doing. Uh, you don't say, okay, you know, I've accomplished that. I'll move on to the next task. Rather, these are things that we constantly aspire to. Practical wisdom, obligation of self to other, and compassion. And while it's not strictly listed here, I would submit to you that trust is operating in each of these. In one of Dr. Siegler's many classic papers, he proposed the physician-patient accommodation model of the doctor-patient relationship. And in the paper, he, he explores unilateral models and then, then presents this, this model that, that retains mutual autonomy and that it involves shared decision-making. And uh, through this, said that earned trust develops through dialogue. And this is how we determine, what is, we determine what is right and good for a particular patient in a particular situation. Two of my colleagues uh, have written uh, about trust. Um, Peter, in some of his work on informed consent, had noticed uh, or noted that the informed consent process seems to be about establishment of trust rather than purely information transfer. Alex Langerman published a paper recently about trust as a predictor of patient perceptions of trainee independence in surgery. This is an interesting paper, um, and, and I would say this tells a cautionary tale. Uh, it, it, it's co-authored by the Dalai Lama, and uh, I would say that it might be on all of our bucket lists to co-author an ethics paper with the Dalai Lama. Um, the, the cautionary tale is that uh, they, they state that current healthcare delivery models limit the development of compassionate engagement. And I would say compassionate, trusting engagement. Time spent with patients. There, there, there's more and more you know, emphasis on spending less time with, with a given patient in order to see more patients or continuity of care. And there are, there are certain surgical care models that seek to minimize or even eliminate a surgeon's role in non-operative evaluation and care of a patient. You know, promoting the notion of surgeon as purely technician, something which I roundly reject for the concept of surgeon as a complete physician. And so this, this cautionary tale really resonates with me as a 60-year-old physician. So what is trust? Uh, you, you know it when you feel it. 
you, you appreciate it when someone bestows their trust upon you. But what is trust? Well, there are a variety of definitions, and many include the phrase, the optimistic acceptance of vulnerability. And think about that for a minute. That, that's, that's a really powerful phrase, isn't it? it it's, it's very thought provoking. Some elements of trust in positions that have been acknowledged or recognized are interpersonal communication, technical competency, and agency, or loyalty, fidelity. And trust is born of conditions characterized by risk, uncertainty, and vulnerability. And that sounds a lot like surgery to me. This photo is me with a, a patient with, with a complex laryngotracheal stenosis whom I've cared for for more than a quarter of a century. And, and our relationship is very much built upon trust. And she was thrilled to know that I would include a photo of her in this talk today. So how does trust develop between a surgeon and a patient? We published this paper earlier this year on patient perceptions of exactly that. And my co-authors uh, are Lulia Kana, who was our pre-doctoral ethics fellow at Michigan at the time. She's now a resident in otolaryngology. Andy Schumann, uh, who's a head and neck surgeon and co-chair of our clinical ethics program. And Janice Fern, uh, who was a PhD bioethicist and social worker, who was the principal clinical ethicist with our program. And she's an expert in qualitative research. The nuts and bolts of this study are that it was qualitative and interview based. Subjects were recruited at the time of surgery scheduling uh, using convenient sampling. What that means is following an outpatient clinic visit, when a patient made a decision to have surgery, they were asked if they were interested in participating in the study. If so, they were subsequently contacted, underwent an interview that was uh, recorded and transcribed. And these were thematically analyzed using an inductive open coding strategy, employing reflexivity to try and limit bias. The convenience sampling led to these descriptive statistics. There was uniformity of race, a gender mix was equal. Most of the patients had had surgery previously. Uh, a few, small percentage, had had surgery by the current surgeon before, uh, many not. And the subspecialties listed there reflect a uh, subspecialties in an otolaryngology head and neck surgery clinic. And data from this study led to three themes. And I'm gonna review each of those themes now. The first was uh, trust across various contexts. And trust in a surgeon was felt to have exceptional weight and consequences compared to other contexts. People mentioned that the, the gravity of the circumstances and the extreme vulnerability. The nature of trust itself uh, seems to operate similarly to other contexts. That is, when people noted differences, it would go back to the, the exceptional, or the weight and consequences or the gravity of the circumstance. And people noted that inherent trust or distrust in physicians may exist. And a few supportive quotes, um, surgery or trust in the context of surgery is quite a bit different. You're gonna be unconscious. You're gonna be essentially helpless, unable to advocate for yourself. Trust is the same compared to trust in other doctors. I feel confident with them. So inherent trust in physicians. Then going on to say, I think it's very important trust in surgery because your life could be in balance or, or something could go wrong. So you need to have real complete trust. Again, going back to kind of the gravity of the circumstances when characterizing a difference for trust in a surgeon. The second theme was the impact of prior knowledge upon trust. That's prior knowledge before the clinical encounter. And this was felt to set the stage for development of trust if it was present. And not everyone had prior knowledge before they met their surgeon, prior knowledge of the surgeon. Uh, sources of prior knowledge include you know, online sources, you know, word of mouth, family, friends, uh, or other providers. Also, some people had institutional trust. That is, they, they knew of or had had care at the institution of the provider before and that that set the stage for them to have trust in the individual. Prior experiences with healthcare 
good or bad, uh, could also impact trust. Uh, some supporting quotes. Um, I was reading his Google reviews, and they were really good. And we're, we're all aware of Google reviews these days and the impact that they may have. I was nervous because I never met her before. And someone who had a family member who worked in anesthesiology who had asked about the surgeon that they were going to be seeing, and the anesthesiologist said good things about that doctor, and that helped set the stage for developing trust in that surgeon. And then the last quote, you know, reflecting institutional trust. You know, this institution has a reputation for being one of the best care centers. And that, again, and it set the stage for them to develop trust. The third thing, which was overwhelmingly the dominant thing, was the importance of the interpersonal connection with the surgeon during the clinical encounter. Participants stressed the relational, not the transactional elements of the clinical encounter. They mentioned communication, things like kindness, respect, the knowledge that the surgeon had. And a really interesting finding from this was that observing a surgeon interacting with other team members in the healthcare team also impacted the development of trust in that surgeon. Some supporting quotes. Um, there wasn't anything before I met him. It was just the one-on-one -on -one and the way he handled himself. When she came in, she was warm and very nice. Looked me straight in the eye. Talked to me, not to the computer. The other surgeon that I actually did not go with walked in, went to the computer, started talking at the computer, and didn't even look at it. Uh, gosh, I remember he was a very kind-hearted person who seemed to genuinely care about. And then the last one about relationships with other members of the care team, he seems to have good relationships with other people that work with him rather than being distanced. That would be a good sign to me. And so again, the, the data from this study led to these three themes, the importance of trust uh, or the significance trust across various contexts where trust in the surgeon was felt to have exceptional weight and consequences. Impact of prior knowledge upon trust. This could set the stage for development of trust if it existed. And then overwhelmingly, the dominant thing was the interpersonal connection with the surgeon during the clinical encounter. Uh, some limitations of this study include the modest sample size and the relative homogeneity of the participants. Uh, some future directions uh, that, that I, I would propose, I'd enjoy it if we have some conversation about that today, um, I, I've listed there. And the impact of trusting relationships upon clinician well-being, Peter already, I think, discussed uh, very uh, things relevant to that concept. Uh, and also trust as a potential quality measure is something that's, that's potentially very interesting to me in the future as well. And I'll close with a quote from our paper that the, the power of the interpersonal transaction among surgeon and patient is at the crux of this reflection. And I think it's incumbent upon us to promote care models and to educate young surgeons in a way that acknowledges this. Uh, lastly, a, a shout out to my McLean Center class. Uh, at the left is our, our group on our first day in July of 2018. At right uh, are the surgeons in, in, in my cohort together with Peter at our graduation. If any of you happen to be listening, um, I miss you guys uh, and our Wednesdays in the McLean Library. Thank you very much. Thanks, Norman. That was uh, wonderful, and uh, I, I agree. We, uh, I think, we all miss the ability to uh, meet in person, and uh, looking forward to being able to do that uh, someday soon. Um, so, uh, I'll again encourage you. There have been some uh, excellent questions posted. If people have others, please go ahead and put them in. Um, it's really a pleasure to introduce the next speaker. 
Uh, Megan Applewhite, MD, MA, FACS, is an associate professor of surgery and chair of the Center for Ethics, Education, and Research at Albany Medical College. She is also a consultant bioethicist for the Department of Defense Medical Ethics Center. Uh, Dr. Applewhite is the director of the Alden March Bioethics Institute at Albany Medical College and holds the John A. Balent, MD, Chair of Medical Ethics in the college. She completed her general surgery residency at Leahy Hospital and Medical Center, and we were fortunate enough to have her as our endocrine surgery fellow at the University of Chicago, where she also completed the McLean Fellowship for Clinical Medical Ethics. Her research interests include surgical ethics, uh, healthcare of the incarcerated patient population, and military medical ethics. Um, today, she'll be speaking about ethical challenges encountered by third-year medical students in their surgery rotations. Welcome, Megan. Hi, thank you so much for uh, that kind of introduction. And I just wanna say um, thanks again to Dr. Siegler for uh, allowing me to come and talk about our research. Um, I'm really excited today to talk to you all about this project that we've been working on for the last several years. Um, and really, uh, we've got a huge um, support from our leadership in, in the college uh, to be able to spend a lot of face time with our medical students uh, throughout their four years. And it's really been through the um, very direct work of Dr. Wayne Shelton, who is a McLean Fellow in 1993 and 1994, uh, who is very much with intention decided to study uh, bioethics education in medical students. And um, particularly uh, as the years progress in the third and fourth years, um, it can become a little bit more challenging to, um, I guess, create an educational curriculum that is uh, meaningful and impactful. And so he's really made a concerted effort to grow this program. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to work with him on this, uh, on this project. So uh, the course as it is, is called Healthcare and Society. It is a four-year longitudinal medical school curriculum. The first couple of years, um, and this is not meant for, uh, for you to read in detail, but just to demonstrate the face time that we're able to get with the students. We have um, about 50 uh, topics that we cover with them over the first two years of their education. Um, which has now actually been consolidated down to 18 months, probably with um, most of your medical schools as well, um, if that hasn't happened already. But, you know, the idea is, is that we have large group discussions during this time. We have small groups. Um, their small groups are consistent through the first year and then um, again through the second year with consistent uh, faculty members uh, leading their small groups of about 10 to 12 students. And so they really get to know one another really well um, during these first couple of years. Uh, the students consistently impress us. They are very vulnerable. They are very vocal. They are very uh, clear headed and um, they get along so well uh, in this type of um, uh, situation where we can put them in a room to talk about these sensitive topics. And, and they really do develop an incredible toolbox of vocabulary and of um, uh, just knowledge of these um, sort of ethical dimensions of care, as, as uh, Peter pointed out, the ethical dimensions of surgical care, which is not necessarily, you know, which vessel do you ligate and which one do you leave alone, or how do you remove the thyroid and what steps, um, not particularly clinical things, uh, but more of the, the human side, uh, more of the personal and social side of, um, of medicine and of what they're likely to encounter in their next couple of years. So when we move forward to the third and fourth years, or what is the clinical years, um, the question is how to maintain uh, that rigor and that kind of um, environment uh, to foster discussion and lively um, communication about uh, challenging ethical problems. Um, if we're not there hands-on with them every step of the way, we lose control. We lose control of the curriculum. We lose control of, uh, of what they learn and what they see. Uh, but one thing that we do know that has been shown time and again, um, and here in this uh, 2011 academic medicine paper, is that empathy declines. So they did a systematic review uh, that investigated the determinants of, development of, and changes in empathy during medical school and residency. So we'll look at the, um, just the results of the 11 medical school surveys that they did and or the uh, papers they evaluated. And they all used tools for self-assessment of empathy. And what they found was 
um, that no studies documented an increase in self-assessed empathy of trainees. Um, the nine of the 11 studies looking at medical student empathy found a significant decline in empathy as training progressed, specifically when entering the clinical setting. So why? What happens? This is, this is the moment that so many of them wait for, that they look forward to, and that they say, I'm going to start getting to do what I've wanted to do for so long, what I've worked toward for so long. So what happens? Um, their distress was identified to be a factor that influenced a decline in empathy. And, and what was distress? How did they, how did they qualify distress? Burnout low sense of well-being, reduced quality of life, and depression. And these are real things, right? And they start as early as the first clinical experiences that medical students have. So what happens and how can we, how can we better understand it so that we can, we can maybe remedy it going as far out as, as attendings and um, more senior faculty? The causes of distress in these, um, these manuscripts were thought to be um, mistreatment by superiors or mentors, um, that their values of idealism, of their enthusiasm, and their values of humanity declined. Uh, what they really valued about going into medicine sort of tapered away and was replaced by technology and objectivity. They lost their social support. Many felt that they had social support problems. And and who knows if it's because they were distant from family for a longer period of time, or if it was because they're sort of experiencing this, this loss of enthusiasm, this loss of idealism, and, and, and this high value for humanity, and, and just don't have an outlet to talk about it with anyone. They also identify the formal, informal curriculum, uh, which they, they, they stated was fragmented physician-patient relationships that they witness, whether it's, it's turnover of attendings, of residents, handoffs, um, miscommunications, lack of communication. Um, they said it an unsuitable learning environment and inadequate role models. So when we were thinking about how to develop this third and fourth year and when Dr. Shelton was going through and, and trying to, with very clearly, as I said before, with intention, think about the best way to, to understand what happens, um, thought, well, let's learn about the hidden curriculum. So the hidden curriculum is a set of lessons which are learned, but are not openly intended to be taught in schools. So it's the norms, the values, and the beliefs conveyed in the classroom and social environment. Um, so it's not necessarily the medical, the clinical parts of the job. It's not the dosing of, of Tylenol. It's not the, the drip of morphine. It's not the um, you know, particular indication for surgery. Uh, it's more of the, the, the value-laden um, um, sort of take-homes that they, they earn or that they learn. It often refers to knowledge gained, usually with a negative connotation, but not always. And in the case of medical students, as we just saw, it's suggested to contribute to the decrease in empathy, uh, beginning at the time of training when patient contact starts. So how do we learn to fix it? How do we learn about it so we can fix it if it's hidden? So the idea came to us that we should ask. We should ask the students and we should ask in a safe space. So to allow them to dictate what we talked about, telling us what they learned that maybe we didn't intend for them to learn in the hospital. So uh, it was set up in this way that during the clinical years of medical, medical school, every couple of weeks, and this begin, began with internal medicine um, and has been going on for several years in internal medicine, and we've added surgery, obstetrics and gynecology, pediatrics, and psychiatry. And um, every couple of weeks when the students are on these rotations, they will meet with um, a bioethics faculty member and or a, um, one of the clinicians and one of the clinicians or just the bioethics faculty member. So there's not always a clinician in there. Um, and that's, that's intentional sometimes. Um, and before they come together to talk, uh, each of them is asked to submit a vignette, basically um, an ethical or value-laden um, encounter or a situation they found themselves in uh, that 
that has been meaningful to them for some reason. Either it's distressing, um, it's caught, made them sad, or it's it's confused them. But it's something that is that is one of these, uh, as Dr. Angela says, uh, you know, one of the ethical dimensions of the care that we give, um, or in patient uh, in patient treatment that we can't necessarily. Um, teach in a didactic lecture. So what did they receive that we didn't intend to give them that they wanted to talk about? So they submit a vignette and accompanying that is a survey that talks about various uh, components of the vignette. And I'll get to that um, in just a moment. So um, at the very beginning of this, um, we submitted an IRB and so that we could collect and catalog all of these things. Um, so the goals of our study are to, to catalog and understand the untaught events and encounters that influence the ethical, social, and professionalism aspects of medical education. It's to encourage a critical and intentional evaluation of the learning environment in an effort to explicitly recognize these value-laden situations that mold students' professional identity development. And ultimately, the goal would be to incorporate the awareness of these findings into trainee and faculty development efforts to increase communication, to maintain empathy, ideally, uh, to improve patient care and provider well-being. So for this study, um, in of the bigger study, um, is uh, we just looked at one academic year of these um, of these vignettes and their accompanying surveys. Um, and basically took every MS3, all of their surveys and vignettes, and then broke them up into what we called surgical clerkships, which was surgery and OB and GYN, and non-surgical clerkships, uh, which was internal medicine and pediatrics. Uh, we did leave psychiatry out because their data is so interesting and it sort of confounded the picture in a way. Uh, and that's gonna be a separate paper because it is, the students are so insightful. It's so it's so remarkable. Um, but that's that's uh, to talk about another day. Um, so they come and they discuss the cases in the small groups that they're very familiar with, um, and they're very familiar with the setting, having done it since they were first years, um, with one to two moderating uh, bioethics faculty. And then what we did was we just um, analyzed the type of um, the type of uh, vignette that they submitted. Uh, the outcome and the impact of the difficult cases um, compared, comparing the surgical groups with the non-surgical groups. So here are samples of some of our questions. Um, what does the primary issue or concern in this case mostly pertain to? And they could choose one and we defined those for them. Uh, what was your clinical, who was your clinical mentor at the time uh, that this case occurred? And the, the choice is um, attending or resident. Did you share your concerns about this case with your clinical mentor or team? And if not, why not? Uh, were you worried about how it would impact your, your evaluation? Were you worried that you would appear naive? Did you not feel there was enough time to discuss it? Did you feel uncomfortable about it? Uh, was there another reason? How would you rate your clinical mentor as a professional role model in the management of the case that you posted? And if you encountered this kind of case or a similar one as a future physician, how closely would you emulate the way that it was managed by your clinical mentor or the other or physician uh, involved? And finally, as a result of your involvement in the case posted, did you experience any moral distress? So we defined the types of concerns uh, very clearly so that they could understand if they're saying it was ethics, it would be qualified as um, ethics if it were um, one of these inclusion criteria, professionalism, quality of care, um, or medical surgical. We also defined moral distress um, um, as, uh, it, as something that occurs when someone knows the right thing to do, but certain constraints governing the situation one is working within make it nearly impossible to pursue the right course of action. Our hypothesis for this study uh, was that the distribution of case types would differ between the surgical and non-surgical groups. And that as compared to the non-surgical groups, the surgical groups would be less comfortable reporting challenging cases to their mentors. And our results effectively found this. Um, so the case categories um, differed when comparing the non-surgical clerkships to the surgical clerkships, um, with more um, ethical cases being categorized in the surgical clerkships and um, it being split mostly between quality of care and ethics for uh, the non-surgical clerkships. 
The mentor was more likely to be an attending in the non-surgical clerkships. They were more likely to share their concerns with the mentor in the non-surgical clerkships. Um, and it's for a variety of reasons. How well the mentor handled the case was thought to be better in the non-surgical clerkships and they wished to emulate their mentors uh, more frequently uh, in this case. They experienced more moral distress uh, in the surgical clerkships. So these are just a couple of uh, excerpts from the vignettes that will sort of demonstrate the breadth of different um, of, of these sort of value laden um, issues that they bring forth. And they're not all bad. Some of them are really good, but it's just sort of these, you know, these, these less clinical, less profoundly medical questions that people encounter in more of the, the, um, uh, the gray areas of medicine that they're learning. So the, um, this first one says uh, regarding um, denying surgery to a two pack per day, super morbidly obese patient with a reducible uh, ventral hernia. Um, what is the line that we draw um, of when to operate versus when not to operate? Um, if this patient had been admitted to the emergency department emergently, they may have received an operation. Um, this was extremely, um, this was an extremely complex uh, situation to work in. Um, and, uh, and it was, um, uh, it was fascinating to compare the provider risk and the patient risk and reward. Um, regarding a 35 year old motor vehicle accident with an irreversible in with irreversible injuries, our attending explained to us and to the family that that care was futile, but we decided to do a trach for the patient anyway to help the family better cope with their loss and prepare for their loved one's imminent death. This case made me heavily consider the idea of a peaceful death and how often family will want everything done, even when it's not necessarily the best for the patient. I've been surprised by some of the language and comments made by attendings, residents, and scrub techs while in the operating room. Uh, this, this one I'll summarize, but it basically talks about how they're asked to put in orders when they're rounding so that the residents can spend more time with the patients. And although that makes sense to the student, it also makes them feel really uncomfortable. Um, and, and finally, this one um, discusses that the residents and the physicians uh, were extremely skilled and knowledgeable, but the bedside manner oftentimes leaves patients very upset. That many times the residents would leave in the middle of a conversation and medical students would um, be left to give answers that were oftentimes not sufficient for patient needs. So these, these students, as I say, are very thoughtful. Um, and from the institution um, administered course evaluation, um, we found that greater than 95% of students either agree or strongly agree that healthcare and society in their third year decrease their overall stress level. And this matters, right? This matters. This is a big deal because if this is the time when empathy begins to decline and we can somehow decrease the burden of stress um, and depression and, you know, we, I can't say all those things. We didn't study whether or not that happens, but sort of overall well-being. Um, that's re that's really meaningful, and 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 hopefully it means that you know we can we can do better and do more. We also find that the faculty participants are enthusiastic about the course; that they can sort of review the clinical care through the lens of a student, and that enhances their compassion. So, points of discussion that that, that we get into are um, why are students in the surgical rotations um, more likely to have moral distress, less likely to talk to their mentors. Is it the demands or the pace of the service? Is it the setting of the rotation that there isn't really a forum for thoughtful discussion? Is it the hierarchy of the discipline that the contact time with the attendings is potentially less? And there are stereotypes that surgeons aren't approachable or aren't, aren't as kind as other physicians. Um, and can we prime surgeons and, and other physicians to be more receptive to these types of concerns? So in conclusion, as students evolve and develop their professional identity and moral agency, we are finding that we have the opportunity to uncover these value-laden influences that mold them. Having meaningful discussions and open communication at all levels, beginning in medical school, may allow for maintenance of empathy and compassionate care. And so from what we've learned so far is that just acknowledging that the job comes with difficult decisions, encounters, and outcomes may be therapeutic, and it may help to shape the, the professional identity of trainees. And then understanding the untaught for these disciplines can enhance communication and support for each other, our trainees and our patients. And we have much more to come as we're doing the uh, qualitative analysis of these vignettes and, and our um, surveys are improving. 
I just want to say thank you again for this opportunity, and I, I would look forward to any feedback and your questions. Thank you, Megan. That was wonderful, uh, and I think uh, really gives us a lot to think about. You know how we are being perceived by the students who rotate with us. Um, so uh, again, I encourage you to put in your questions. There are a lot there, and go ahead and vote those that you think are most important to address. Um, it's uh, uh, my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, uh, Gina Piscatello, MD, is an assistant professor of palliative medicine, hospital medicine and an ethics consultant at Rush University Medical Center. Her research interests involve patient family and clinician communication, ethics education for medical trainees, and allocation of scarce medical resources. Uh, Gina completed her clinical ethics fellowship at the McLean Center, and she'll be speaking today about the topic of the ethics of extracorporeal membrane oxygenation in practice. Uh, so welcome, Gina. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Angelos. And um, I want to start off by saying thank you to Dr. Siegler for allowing me to speak today. Um, the topic I'm talking about, I worked on with a, um, a bunch of different people, many of them who are past McLean Ethics Fellows. So I just want to say thank you to them right off the bat. Um, that includes Renee Vermea, John Stokes, Whitney Gannon, Anthony Canalides, Megan Kanaka, Claire Chappelle, Pat Lyons, Laura Fry, Mark Siegler, of course, and then Will Parker, who helps with helps me with most of my ethics projects. Um, so thank you to you all. Um, so today I'm talking about the ethics of extracorporeal membrane oxygenation and practice. And so we did a study, um, the group of I and I, the group the group that I just mentioned and I. Um, surveying seven different hospitals um, about how do they actually use ECBO in practice. Um, it was a cross-sectional study that was done in January 2021. Um, as you mentioned too, I have no financial disclosures. So ECMO, this is a picture um, from Rush Hospital. There's a, um, a video online kind of explaining um, to the community what ECMO is. And so this is a very common occurrence in the hospital. This patient, he is on ECMO, walking around the hospital doing laps. Um, many of the patients, especially if they are able to be mobile, this is very important for them to be um, mobile to help get them off ECMO when they are ready um, the best way possible. So there's different forms of ECMO. Um, if your heart or your lung has failed, that would be the reason for ECMO support. It is an advanced form of life support that can only be done in the hospital setting. So it is unique in that other forms of life support like mechanical ventilation, um, those could be done potentially at a long-term acute care hospital if you have a tracheostomy place and you could be discharged or like dialysis care, that could be done outside of the hospital. But ECMO currently can only be done in an acute care hospital. And with that, there's an intense amount of um, support that's needed for those patients. So those patients often have a one-to-one -one nurse, so a nurse specifically just for them, and then an ECMO tech assigned just for them. So you have increased staffing needs. Um, you can see from this picture, there's a lot going on with the machine behind them. These patients, sometimes they're just on it for like a few hours or days. Sometimes they're on it nine months. And so the hospital costs that are associated with this can add up to over a million dollars if they're on it for that long of a time period too. There's data that shows that um, the predicted um, cost per quality of life year for ECMO is about $30,000. And ECMO for some people, it's a true miracle. For adult patients, there are some people with ECMO, they are alive and they're able to survive for a long time period after that because of it. But fi about 50% of patients who are placed on ECMO, adult patients do die before discharge. So there's quite a um, high mortality rate. So I wanna start us off with a case here. Um, so this is a hypothetical case, but a very similar case to what's actually occurred um, at most, multiple hospitals across the country during COVID. So a 30 year old female with history of a BMI greater than 35 is admitted to the intensive care unit with acute respiratory distress syndrome, secondary to COVID pneumonia. They place her on, um, she requires intubation. She's on 100% oxygen, nitric oxide, but her oxygen levels are still low. So that would be a reason that they would put her on ECMO and they put her on venovenous ECMO because only her lungs were failing, not her heart. So that was the reason for that. Now, fast forward, nine months later, she's still on ECMO, awake and alert, she is happy with her quality of life, a little bit of anxiety because she isn't allowed to leave the hospital. With the strict visitor restrictions, her husband had had, had um, trouble coming in to visit her because of those restrictions. The hospital did the best that they could to get her husband in, but he also needs to work. Um, 
And so that's been difficult. And then her young children, it's been very hard for her to be away from her young children. So she's had a lot of anxiety with that, but she goes around the unit with for walks. She, um, the nurses love her, the, the team just loves her. Um, but there's thought that her lungs will never improve enough where she can be successfully liberated from ECMO and actually survive it. So this talk, we're gonna talk about kind of these topics about patients who are on ECMO for a long time, but I wanna put one more part into the story. And that is that she is a total candidate for a, meta, um, for a lung transplant, but she is not considered because she is an undocumented immigrant and has no health insurance in the United States. So this case happened at multiple hospitals across the country where the patient had a true medical indication for a lung transplant and were declined at multiple centers solely because of their financial inability to, inability to pay. There is data on this that patients who donate organs, about 12% of those patients that donate organs um, from a 2003 study, are people without insurance. So people are allowed to donate, but then only 0.8% of people who receive organ transplants are um, without insurance. So they're donating a lot, but they're not being able to receive them. And that's what this data, or what these cases showed us as well. I think the unique case about ECMO is that when patients are on ECMO for this long of a time period, their hospital costs are excessive. Would it not be cheaper to pay for a lung transplant and lifelong immunosuppression and get them on off ECMO than to continue them on ECMO long-term? Um, and so those are very important um, ethical issues, you know, just the cost, that's one thing. Um, but then there's also that we have our, um, the um, 1984 National Organ Transplant Act um, and the um, Organ Procurement and Transplantation Network who both say organ transplants must be equitable. And they're not equi equitable. And we saw that during the COVID-19 pandemic into this current day. So on um, the topics that we looked at with this survey of um, the multiple hospitals, we're looking at exclusion criteria for ECMO, informed consent, and then withdrawal of ECMO. This is just kind of a baseline of who did we survey? And so each hospital that we surveyed, the seven hospitals, every department that um, placed patients on ECMO, they were eligible to be included. And we asked one person from each of the hospitals to speak on behalf of their department for how they view ethical um, concerns with ECMO patients. So you can see here, most of the respondents that we had were attending physicians. The department that they came from varied quite a bit. So we had anesthesia, cardiac surgery, um, emergency medicine, pulmonary critical care, cardiology. Most of the physicians um, or the one nurse practitioner that um, responded, they um, were involved in both veno venous and veno arterial ECMO placement. And then most of the people that responded were male. And so starting off with exclusion criteria. So um, with exclusion criteria, I'm very interested in this topic, especially because I think um, with ventilator allocation, we talked about that a lot, you know, last year and then also this year again. Um, you know, were ventilators actually short in the United States? Like we really didn't hear that information. ECMO was truly scarce in the United States. ECMO exclusion criteria were absolutely used in practice. And I think it was just the emphasis on ECMO was not as prominent as like the ventilator, which was kind of a very um, like trendy topic. Um, with exclusion criteria, um, so I'm going to show you what they were from the respondents. Um, it's kind of a busy slide, and the point is, is that it's a busy slide. So these exclusion criteria varied quite a bit based on department and based on the hospital. So you can see here, 13 of the 14 hospitals had exclusion criteria. And what, the, what they based it on, so looking at age, so that varied quite a bit. Some hospitals, you were over than 60, you just don't get it. Some hospitals, if you were 74, you could still get it. So age, there was quite a difference, body mass index, and then you can look at the medical comorbidity, comorbidities too, that varied quite a bit different. The important thing to note is that this information is not public. And so can a patient have, you know, access, you know, if a patient had access to this information and they were like 70, you know, they could say, oh, well, this hospital might consider me. Like I'm going in for a lung transplant. I might, might end up on ECMO long-term for that period. I'd rather go to a hospital where um, they would consider me for ECMO. Um, you know, we saw during the COVID pandemic, um, there was an article on CNN that some of you might have um, saw. There was a man in Florida that um, was um, had COVID pneumonia, was on life support, and his wife um, was looking all around to see would anyone just give him an ECMO circuit? That's all he needed. And I remember thinking, like, you know, how wonderful this wife is advocating for the patient, but like, you know, there's no chance like this patient's going to get an ECMO circuit. There was nothing in Florida available. It was during the time where um, Florida hospitals were overwhelmed. And then I remember seeing an article like about a month and a half later, an update of that patient. There was a, a physician, I believe he was in Connecticut, who reached out to the family. They transported the patient up to Connecticut, placed the patient on ECMO. He survived. 
And so there are patients that if they had this information, like they would absolutely advocate and like try to get to these centers where they would be eligible for ECMO. And so do these, you know, exclusion criteria, should they be transparent so people are allowed to do that? You know, honestly, like personally, I think that they should be. There is, though, you know, it is important to note, are these absolute exclusion criteria? So I know that certain centers, these are what are written down, but they still do place patients on ECMO even if they um, are on this exclusion list. So um, we can't say for sure in practice that these are absolute exclusion criteria, but these are what was um, um, given to us in the survey. The next slide is looking at um, what were the exclusion criteria for patients with COVID-19. So the extracorporeal life support organization, they actually came up with guidelines for how you should consider excluding patients if they have COVID-19 pneumonia. And so they had guidelines, but you can see here, there's a lot of variety in, in what hospitals did. So these hospitals, even with the guidelines, did not you know, align themselves totally with that guideline from this institution, from that um, support organization. Um, I want to mention that also support um, organization, they had it in, as an um, absolute exclusion criteria, advanced age, but they did not define what advanced age is. I mean, is advanced age 35? There's just, there's a lot of um, concern that like potentially those absolute exclusion criteria could totally withhold ECMO support from certain patients who very well might benefit from it. Um, so on this list, you can see that age um, for um, patients with COVID pneumonia, some of the centers um, significantly decreased the age um, to be considered for ECMO. Um, and then you can see again, body mass index, um, the time on the vent, they required lower time on the vent for patients with COVID-19 pneumonia. And then um, about half of the centers that we surveyed actually changed their criteria just for the COVID patients. So how were decisions made to place patients on ECMO? At most of the centers, you can see here, um, 10 of the 14 departments responded that it is a group decision. We all talk about it and then place a patient on ECMO. But you can see that some of the hospitals, it's an ind individual decision. That that physician, they, want, they think the patient meets criteria for it, they're going to place them on it. Now, talking about informed consent, there's a lot of literature about informed consent for ECMO patients. Is it even possible? It's such a, a complex form of life support, is often done in emergent situations. So we asked questions about that in this survey as well. The most common person that was included in the informed consent process was the attending physician or fellow physician. And you can see those are like the um, darker blue and the um, orange on the, on the graph here. The interesting thing is I just wanted to see, you know, some of these patients are on life support for quite a long time on the ECMO. And, you know, do we ever include people like social work or palliative care, just people um, who might be able to um, help holistically evaluate a patient's preferences and value for care up front in the informed consent process. And you can see palliative care, social work, that was in the um, light blue and green categories. They were rarely included up front in that informed consent process. When informed consent was done, um, my slide, can you advance it? Thank you, great. Um, so for patients who we thought the life expectancy was 24 hours or longer, the average length of time spent obtaining informed consent was about 25 minutes. But when they expected life expectancy of the patient was less than an hour, the average time spent consenting the patient was about seven minutes or so. So in an emergent situation, is, there, is it possible to cons consent a patient totally, you know, fully for ECMO? I think it'd be a very difficult thing. Plus, for many of these patients, are they even awake and alert to consent? Or are you consenting their alternate decision maker instead? Um, how long does informed consent last? That varies quite a bit based on the clinician um, that responded to the survey. So some informed consent is done. Once that cannula is put in for the ECMO, informed consent is done, we must read consent for anything else. Other people though believe that informed consent, when you con consent to ECMO, that continues your entire hospital course. Um, now one thing, and I think this was something the discussion of a time limited trial. I guess initially, kind of before the survey, I was thinking, you know, discussion of a time limited trial and that informed consent process that might really help down the road. You know, in these situations where we have people on life support nine months, with that, you know, considering do we consider withdrawal of ECMO later on down the road? So we asked clinicians, would you do you think it is important to discuss a time limited trial up front in this informed consent process? And we asked them based on patient diagnosis. Should it be asked? And so you can see here, there's certain diagnoses that physicians really agree it should be discussed in the informed consent process. So um, for patients like who have experienced a cardiac arrest or interstitial lung disease, um, those are patients we really should include it up front. Now, even if we included it up front, though, that informed consent for a time limited trial, we say like, you know, we're going to put you on ECMO and do it full out for 30 days. But if you're not improving, we are going to remove ECMO. Even if the patient agreed to that up front, 30 days later, if they say, well, I'm awake and alert, my quality of life is great to me. I want to spend more time with my family and friends. I want to remain on it. 
could we still withdraw it and say like, oh, well, you consented, you know, 30 days ago to the withdrawal, we're still going to withdraw it now. I think, you know, we're finding in practice that would be very difficult to do. And actually in like real situations where that has occurred, what happened, what ended up happening in the situations that I'm aware of is that the decision was actually made. The patient says, continue, we will continue. Now, this is asking if a patient is going to surgery, just a generic surgery now, is it okay to just place them on ECMO without getting their consent beforehand? So if a patient's going to surgery and something unexpected happens, do you need to say up in front in surgical um, informed consent, oh, well, if something unexpected happens, we might place you on ECMO. Most of the clinicians surveyed here say, no, we do not need to discuss ECMO beforehand. If you consent to the surgery, you're consenting to ECMO, even though you don't know even what ECMO is. And so there's a certain population that potentially they might end up on ECMO and they don't even know what ECMO is. And we had time to consent them and we chose not to. This is looking at patient preferences and values for care. So the graph on the left is asking, um, do patients and surrogates always have informed consent for ECMO? You can see in six of the, six of the um, clinician um, department respondents said, no, they do not. The graph in the middle, are we giving patients and surrogates the option to withdraw ECMO? Four of the departments say that we do not offer patients and physicians the option to withdraw ECMO, even if they ask for that. In personal experience, I have seen that that has been um, um, thought to be true in practice, but then, you know, the clinician taking care of the patient, you know, I, I asked in that situation, well, did you ask your attending that? And then the attending's like, no, of course you could withdraw ECMO. So, but that some people do believe that we cannot withdraw ECMO um, for ECMO patients. We, we do not offer that option to patients. And then the graph on the right is asking for patients on ECMO, um, are we always aware of the preferences and values of care of that patient on ECMO that we're caring for? And in six of the centers, um, they responded, we do not always know the preferences and values of, of care of that patient we're caring for on ECMO. And so that can lead that people right now could exist on ECMO and they are not okay with it because we do not, we have not tried to assess their preferences for care um, for that patient. And now withdrawal of ECMO, we asked a question to respondents. If a patient's awake and alert on ECMO, they have significant lung failure that will never improve. They're not a lung transplant candidate. They are awake and alert. Their quality of life is good. What should be done in that situation? Five of the ECMO centers said, they, said that they should withdraw ECMO. Six of the ECMO centers said that continue ECMO, but if they got worse, do not escalate support. So they had like a pneumonia, you wouldn't escalate support. One of the ECMO centers said continue ECMO, escalate support, but do not change that circuit or oxygenator. And then two of the centers said, you know, we'll escalate, we'll continue ECMO and escalate support. If they had a pneumonia, we're gonna treat the pneumonia too. The important thing here is how much variety there is between these centers. A patient at one hospital might potentially be withdrawn from ECMO who is awake and alert. They, their quality of life is valuable to them. They might be withdrawn because of their own, that center's, you know, beliefs about that. Where another center might actually continue them on it forever. Um, and life expectancy, so, you know, a center, potentially a patient might have 30 days to live, where another center it might be nine months to live. And this information is not public. It's happening in practice, but it's not public. So patients wouldn't know um, how to advocate for it. Ethics consults with ECMO, you can see here about half the centers, they say there's been at least one ethics consult on a patient they've cared for in ECMO. One of the centers, every patient in ECMO gets an ethics, ethics consult. Some of the other reasons for ethics consults would um, deal with like kind of um, considering withdrawal of ECMO support. And then finally, I wanted to mention, so allocation during periods of true scarcity. You know, for me personally, if a patient's awake and alert, they want to remain on ECMO and ECMO is not scarce, I also agree with them remaining on ECMO. Now, is it equitable that we spend a million dollars on one patient, like the patient in the transplant and the um, case that I discussed? You know, she's undocumented, her husband's undocumented. We spend a million dollars on her, but then her husband can't even afford a basic inhaler as an outpatient. That's not equitable care, but I don't think we should take from one, remove from one of these ECMO patients and then, um, you know, to give to another. Why can't we, you know, keep the ECMO patient, but then also focus on improving the quality of medical care for her husband and other people. But now in periods of true scarcity, I think that kind of changes, that we really need to look holistically and have like big centers looking at where are ECMO circuits available to try to not ration it in the first place. But if they are short, you know, if we have people on ECMO for a long time period, we end up with a first come first serve method where people who got on it first, they're allowed to stay. But then another patient who might benefit from it doesn't have that same equitable access. And then last statement really quick, there is talk about a new consideration of a new definition of death for patients on ECMO. So we talked yesterday about, you know, consideration of brain death or higher function death. There is now talk that patients who are awake and alert on ECMO, um, are they dead if they can truly not be liberated from it? You know, the machine is doing all the work. Are they, could that be considered death? 
And if so, like that would, you know, potentially lead to more organ transplantation availability to do organ transplants in those patients. So I think that's kind of a controversial topic, but it's a very interesting topic. And I think there's a lot more to come on that. So thank you. Gina, thank you very much. A uh, huge wealth of ethical issues that uh, you've raised and uh, a number of people are asking some good questions related to that. Um, so the next speaker is uh, Dr. Alex Langerman, um, who is a head and neck surgeon and researcher at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, Alex spent his career studying the operating room and the surgical profession through the lens of, of ethics and innovation. Uh, most of his training was at the University of Chicago, where he also served uh, on the faculty in both uh, otolaryngology and after completing his ethics fellowship at the McLean Center, he was also faculty at the McLean Center before he sadly moved off to Vanderbilt. Uh, now at Vanderbilt, um, Dr. Langerman directs the Surgical Ethics Program at the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Society, where he focuses on surgical ethics education and on studying the surgeon-patient relationship. Today, Alex will be speaking on talking with patients about surgical trainees. Uh, welcome, Alex. Peter, thank you so much, uh, and uh, I miss you too. And, uh, you know, Mark, thank you for including me uh, again in this wonderful, wonderful uh, conference at really the best. One of the most exciting things I think about this year is uh, uh, how surgeons are kind of peppered throughout the agenda in all the different sections. And uh, I'm just pleased to see the legacy of, of Mark and, and, and you, Peter, in uh, uh, engendering surgical ethics as a viable subspecialty within ethics, but also seeing how surgeons have an important voice in all aspects of, um, of bioethics. So thank you. And to all my friends, I miss you. And I wish we were in person perhaps next year. So um, I have no disclosures. Um, so surgeon patient communication uh, is a brief sort of my own outline here. What are things that we might talk to patients about? The details of their disease, options for treatment, we conduct informed consent, we ideally show empathy and compassion, and we also handle as surgeons difficult topics. Now, what does that mean? Traditionally, difficult topics, they're things like errors, bad news, and even more so lately, we talk about triage or rationing, but that's something that sort of classically was in the purview of, of surgeons when you think about trauma. Um, but there's also these controversial difficult topics. So um, these are topics where there's a lot of uncommon knowledge. So, you know, in contrast to maybe these traditional topics such as errors, I mean, if you ask any patient, do errors happen in surgery, any personal lay public, they, they would know that. But there are other things about surgery that are sort of hidden behind the curtain. These are things that the public not, not typically be aware of. There are topics that are ethically ambivalent. So, you know, uh, some people may argue, yes, we should be talking to patients about X. And other people say, you know, I don't think that's a good idea. And I'll get into some reasons why people might not want to talk to patients about these controversial topics. And, uh, you know, to wit, these are topics that are not, not routinely disclosed. Some surgeons believe that they should not be talked about or they fall to the wayside in the face of other uh, topics that may be getting more attention. So what are some examples here? So surgical trainees, which I, uh, I'll enjoy talking a little bit about today, overlapping surgery, uh, innovation, you know, new surgery, and how do we talk about the fact that this is something we might not have done before? Or our own experience, you know, a junior surgeon or a new technique and saying to a patient, I, uh, I, you know, this might be the first time I'm doing this. Um, financial considerations, uh, you know, uh, Peter Ubel talked about a little bit about this, surgeons physicians in general aren't good at it. And, um, you know, that's a tough topic, but also the role that it might play in decision-making is very controversial. Uh, video recording and recording in general in the operating room, a topic I care a lot about, certainly something that's being introduced and has a lot of controversy surrounding it. And then uh, artificial intelligence and its role in surgical decision-making and how to discuss this with patients. These are all important topics. So what do uh, people say um, when they... Um, 
argue they shouldn't do it. Well, more harm than good, right? That's an argument for beneficence over autonomy that you might scare a patient or make them upset rather than, you know, really being worth it and saying their autonomy isn't as important as making sure that they're, uh, they're uh, protected from this bad information. Uh, they say that patients won't participate. So, you know, you have this idea of, um, participation in a learning a health system, artificial intelligence, participation in overlapping surgery in the, in the sense of ensuring that a surgeon can care for as many patients as possible in a day, or, uh, you know, surgical trainees training the future generation of surgeons. People may look at that and say, well, if I talk too much about this, patients are going to say, I don't want trainees, or they're going to say, no, you can't. I, I won't let you do an overlapping case with me or I don't want to participate in this in you know in AI data collection. So from a communitarian perspective or maybe even a justice perspective, you might say that's more important than the autonomy of the patient. That's another argument that some people make. And then of course there's the last one, right? No good way to say it. These are tough conversations. These are hard for people to talk about. And so there's like the Spilkes right as aspect. I just uh, it's uncomfortable to me to to talk about this topic. And and so those are things that people say. Now there's another argument, right? What's the priority of the information that we might be going through? These are difficult topics. These are topics that might take a while to talk about. And there's not usually a ton of time to interact with patients. And so you got to focus on your diagnosis, your intervention, the risk benefits alternative. And uh, as Dr. Hogikian said earlier, and I really loved his talk, trust building, right? Really, really important for the, the surgeon patient relationship. So what do you do when you're researching these topics, if I may propose that you would determine the priority of a given topic uh, relative to the other things you have to talk about with patients, um, identify what patients think about this and the pitfalls, things that they might be really upset about, identify the key talking points if you're going to actually talk about this, and develop ultimately some guidelines for handling these discussions. So um, I'll start with sort of looking at the potential priority of these topics Research I did a while ago, other people have done similar research, but um, this is patients want knowledge and control over what, who does what in the operating room. Patients uh, are particularly interested if a resident's going to be doing something on them, what they're going to be doing and how much autonomy they have and, and all of those details. And so that becomes an important topic. And I'd, I'd argue that patients do want to know it. They think it's important to hear about. Um, we did a study where, which I, I talked about a couple of years ago at this conference, where we showed patients an actual video of two surgeons operating. Um, you know, so there's the the two hands in there, and um, I took a screenshot of the video, and lo and behold, I picked the one shot that doesn't show the two hands in there. I'm sorry, but imagine there are two hands in there operating, and the point was we showed this actual video, and we asked patients to to think about it and then tell us what what how they would describe teamwork you know a, a, a resident and an attending operating together how they would describe it to a patient a fellow patient in a reassuring but truthful manner and what we found was um that they identified these sub themes that they you know the thing they think that the surgeon should tell the patient that there is going to be a resident that's important right that it actually is going to happen um Talk about the activities the resident's going to do, talk about the experience of the resident, talk about supervising, supervising the resident, that the teamwork aspect of it, and some kind of reassuring statement. Um, based on this, uh, uh, these themes, we came up with this kind of spiel, this sort of um, statement that a surgeon might say to a patient. You know, this teaching hospital, there's a resident explaining the resident's a doctor, explain they'll be assisting and learning and that they'll be doing some of it and I'll be there to make sure of it, uh, you know, and I'm in charge. Now, one thing that the caveat, of course, of the statement is this implies the surgeon is going to be there the whole time, which is not always the case. And, you know, so there's some nuances uh, there that, that could be addressed in other forms of research. But for, for the purposes of what we're going to talk about now, we'll just kind of assume this is just resident and attending uh, participation together, which in fact alone is a controversial topic for patients. Um, so we have this statement and uh, we actually, uh, this is work in progress. That's the caveat, right? Which is great about this conference. You can present work in progress. I can change my slides up to three minutes before I talk and, and that's okay. And that's, I love that about this, this conference. So um, what we did in this, in this uh, slide is 
Um, this is this is a M Turk, so mechanical Turk. So these are people who just p- get paid fifty cents to respond to a survey, and we 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 showed them that spiel, and we asked them how they felt about residents participating in surgery both before and after the spiel, and you, admittedly, a little unexpectedly, I think we shifted people to be a little bit less comfortable with residents, just a little bit, not probably statistically significant. This is a work in progress. We we got about fifteen hundred. Uh, surveys probably that we're going to send out. So, um, you know, we're not even near where we're going to finish as far as doing statistics on this. But the point is just visually, you can see that the, um, the, the orange bar, um, you, you know, uh, gets a little lower in the very comfortable and somewhat comfortable, a little higher in the uncomfortable range um, after that quote, which is interesting. You know, you think about, well, if we're going to be truthful, maybe we're going to make people a little uncomfortable. There's probably more to that. And, uh, look for the paper, you know, hopefully next year. Um, so then, you know, so key talking points. So there's a little more to this research here. So then, and here's, sorry for the busy slide. And I'll just a little shout out to Peter and, and Rumsfeld for the unknowns unknowns, which I love Peter's use of that in this. So what we did is we dug through uh, interviews with patients from some of the other papers that I had done. We dug through interviews with surgeons for some of the papers I've done. And my student, William Quatch did all this work. And identified every single thing that a patient or a surgeon said would be something you might want to tell a patient about a resident. And we collected all those things because the idea was, okay, we, we heard patients say in the previous you know, couple slides what they thought would be a reassuring and truthful thing to tell to another patient. But patients don't really know all the things they might get to know. And so there's the unknown unknowns. And so we said, okay, well, let's, let's also present these same patients who did that previous survey you saw with um, all of the potential things they could know about a patient, you know, things about, about a resident, excuse me. So things about the resident themselves, you know, how much they're doing, you know, um, if they're necessary, even for the surgery, things about the attending, you know, and, and whether they thought the resident was good, things about the hospital, um, you know, and that importance perhaps in the hospital's reputation. And then also some distractor questions, some things we probably wouldn't ever consider talking about. You know, if you met the resident, you might know this, but the resident's gender, religion, their age, things like that, that we really consider perhaps distractor questions, but are kind of interesting too, because, you know, it gives us a little bit of discomfort when we think about someone making a decision uh, based on those things. Okay. So on our first 400, again, this is kind of a work in progress, but um, we got you know, so we asked uh, not only the the respondents to to identify uh, sort of on a, on a on a Likert scale how important these things were, but then we had them weigh them as like you know their their top five in order of like the most important things, and we did some calculations to kind of come up with this list. And if you do a little cutoff, you can see that some of the most important things that really stand out, you know, here are you know, perhaps obvious things, right? Who will be performing the majority of the operation? Who's actually going to be doing this, doc? You know, um, what the attending's opinion of the resident is, which is kind of a proxy for, you know, how good is this person going to be? How many times the resident's assisted with a specific surgery? How long the resident's been, you know, performing surgery? Again, proxies, right? For the big question, the big question, how will the resident's involvement affect the success and likelihood of complications? Now, Interestingly, people really, their, their top weighted thing was, you know, uh, how often, how many times has this resident done it before getting at experience in some way, I think is a proxy of, uh, of equality, but there's more to be done here. But the point is we're starting to look at, okay, let's figure out what the, what the bucket is of all the things you could possibly talk about. Let's kind of narrow down what the, what the most important things are. So again, uh, a work in progress and it's an artificial scenario, right? So we're interviewing, we're doing the survey online. Imagine you need surgery, right? That's not the same as as uh, as actually sitting there contemplating surgery, right? And you might think that that might make people uh, more willing to have a resident than if they're really facing it. On the other hand, you know, in these surveys, there's no trusting relationship with a surgeon. And I think patients may say, oh, well, if this surgeon's saying that this is kind of how they do it or, you know, reassure in some way that it's going to be okay, that might be enough as well, you know, and so that is all worthy for the research. But it's also interesting that it gives a sense of 
preconceived notions of the lay public. What do they consider important information? And ours is, you know, it's not necessarily what, what the surgeons told us was going to be the important information. Um, but, but patients actually saying, what would they like to hear if we were going to tell them a little bit about this? And maybe this gets us ultimately, uh, as this work progresses, into an efficient way to talk about it that addresses most of the concerns, is reassuring hopefully in some way, and also per- we can prepare surgeons to handle the typical questions they may get so that we could insert this into a um, surgeon-patient discussion without overly burdening that discussion. Um, so next step, right, develop guidelines and, um, try to find something again, that's truthful and reassuring. Um, that's always been my mantra, but gosh, starting to look at the initial survey results. I wonder how the more truthful we get, maybe we're going to be a little less reassuring. And so that gets back to the original question of autonomy, you know, versus beneficence and, and how is the right way to insert this in there? And so I think that's that's what's interesting about this topic. And that's what's interesting, I think, in general about controversial topics. And that's why we need to keep doing this work. Um, and early, which was, you know, just my goal for the McClellan Conference. Uh, and I'm honestly impressed because we're running completely on time. So uh, kudos to the team handling this. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alex. Uh, that was great, uh, as always. And uh, thank you for ending uh, early so we have even more, uh, l- even a little bit more time for uh, discussion. Um, so there is still a little bit of time for people to put in. Uh, thanks. Uh, there, there's still a little bit of time for people to put in questions. Um, the, the next thing that we're going to uh, go on to is uh, I'm just going to introduce um, very briefly uh, for a few minutes uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Uh, Peggy Kelly and Dr. Vasil Lankina, uh, who uh, have worked with me on a uh, book project um, that hopefully um, some of you might be interested in. Um, Peggy is a pediatric otolaryngologist. She's currently practicing at Providence St. Vincent Medical Center in Portland, Oregon. Um, She completed her undergraduate degree at Stanford University with honors and her medical degree from the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, In 2017, um, she uh, was an American College of Surgeons McLean Center uh, Surgical Ethics Fellow. um, And... um, uh, I'll uh, just also uh, introduce uh, Vasil, who is a cardiac surgeon and cardiac critical care specialist. Um, He was on the faculty of the University of Chicago for many years, Um, also a graduate of the McLean Center for Clinical uh, Medical Ethics Fellowship. Um, Since retiring from the University of Chicago, he's been instrumental in developing the ethics curriculum for the medical school at the University of Ukraine. Uh, and I, I know that um, Vasil is on, and I'm not sure if Peggy is, but uh, I'll turn it over uh, to you both. Hi, thanks, Peter. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I think Peggy's having uh, technical difficulties from Oregon. And so the presentation that she prepared, I will sub in for her. If I can have the first slide. So as Peter said, uh, we we have been working for the last two years on this book. Um, it's called Difficult Decisions in Surgical Ethics. And it is a book that uh, is in a series of books. Next slide, please. Uh, a series of books, uh, which is called Difficult Decisions in Surgery, an Evidence-Based Approach. Uh, the series editor is Mark Ferguson of the University of Chicago, and over... I think over 10 years or more, uh, it started off with thoracic surgery and then multiple other uh, specialties have uh, uh, produced uh, similar volumes over the last uh, 10, 12 years uh, for a total of 11 volumes. This is the 11th volume in this series. Uh, it is multi-authored, um, is devoted to, you know, these uh, books are devoted to s- specific uh, surgical questions, whether it's uh, endocrine surgery or bariatric surgery or trauma and uh, uh, liver, hepatobiliary, et cetera. Uh, 
Next slide, please. And the uh, and these are two of the books that uh, the, the current editors have published. One is in endocrine surgery, and one is in cardiothoracic critical care surgery. Next slide. The, the birth of this idea came about at this conference two years ago, the last conference where we all met together. And during lunch, we sat down, the three of us, and we talked about how great it would be to produce a book by, uh, by basically fellows and graduates of the McLean Center uh, who are surgeons, uh, a surgical thematic uh, book. Uh, and so we, we jotted down a number of uh, subjects and uh, headings that we want to explore. And then we said, let's, uh, let's solicit information and let's talk to our graduates. At that point uh, in 2019, there were 84 graduates that were surgeons of uh, the uh, McLean Fellowship. And so we sent out letters uh, to all of them uh, soliciting information. First of all, are they interested in, in contributing a chapter and what kind of topics are dear to their heart? We got back a, a fair number of uh, great ideas and about 25 people uh, initially responded and we, we ran with that. We, um, we then, next slide, we then sat down and, and made a uh, uh, made our uh, sections. Uh, figured out uh, uh, which which authors are going to contribute to what, and and this is what we came up with. Uh, basically, about eleven subsections in this book. Uh, we were very fortunate to have Dr. Mark Siegler, uh, Dr. Bernie Lowe, and also Dr. Robert Say to contribute uh, introductory chapters. For instance, Mark is talking about the importance of formal education in medical ethics in the uh, 21st century. Uh, Robert Say is talking about what makes surgical ethics unique. Uh, and then the editors themselves have put together a chapter called Notable Ethical Surgeons, in which we talked about uh, each of us picked a few surgeons that we thought uh, exemplified in our eyes uh, what an ethical surgeon uh, is and, and, uh, and, and how that uh, uh, influenced our own practice. So the various other uh, uh, chapters and, and sections that we have uh, deals with, for instance, communication. And Alex Langerman uh, contributed a chapter called Transparency in Surgery. Uh, we have one on informed consent. Is it truly informed? Uh, goals of care and high risk surgery, uh, uh, how to deliver bad news, uh, we call it a, a family post mortem, and then one on surgical empathy. Uh, further, we, uh, we're all educators, uh, and so we have a section on surgical education, teaching surgical ethics, training residents, uh, disclosure to patients, <clears throat> communication during awake surgery. Uh, can professionalism be taught during residency? Uh, uh, and similar to what we've talked about today, informed consent of patients regarding training participation. Uh, we've also talked about medical error and medical discrepancy. Surgical disclosure of errors, disclosing errors of others. Uh, uh, Dr. Hogekian uh, uh, contributed to that chapter. Uh, expert witnesses testifying against... Uh, 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 against colleagues. So uh, we also have a chapter on cultural uh, and religious diversity. Uh, and I think one of, the, one of the very interesting chapters is one about the Moors of the Navajo Nation. We had uh, a surgeon who works with the Navajo Indians and also a native Navajo resident in ENT who put together um, a very detailed chapter on uh, the history of the Navajo Nation, their moors, how you speak to them, uh, how you deal with them, and, and, and et cetera. So that, that, I think, is a very, very interesting chapter, including some videos on uh, the Navajo Nation. We do talk about surgery on the incarcerated patient, which Megan Applewhite has kindly contributed. Uh, and then we talked about dilemmas in adult patients. Uh, surgical buy-in for uh, major surgical procedures, ethics of cesarean section on maternal request, uh, fertil fertility sparing surgery instead of definitive cancer resections, uh, anal sparing surgery. Uh, and then we also have a section on pediatrics and their family. 
uh, we have uh, contributions by uh, Catherine Hunter on the balance and benefits of pediatric ECMO. We talk about brain death in NICU. We talk about the ethics of pediatric bariatric surgery. Uh, critical care. How do we deal with, uh, with families that uh, their loved ones have severe brain injury? Uh, and then burn patients, uh, burn beyond recognition, the ethics of their care. And rationing uh, ventilators when you run out. Another section on do not resuscitate, palliative care, end of life. Uh, perioperative DNR, goals of care of palliative surgery, and conflicts with surgical decision makers. An interesting section is one on global surgery. So we had a pro and con section uh, that we should be doing medical missions, uh, a pro and a con view. And then also a commentary from one of our surgeons, a, a graduate of the McLean Fellowship, who herself uh, is a uh, uh, medical missionary in, uh, in Africa, in, in Lake Ten, uh, Tegeki, uh, Tanzania, um, who commented on, on, uh, on the medical missions uh, in, in that part of the world. Now, because uh, as we started uh, developing our, um, uh, our strategy and our topics, uh, COVID hit, and so we had to add a section on COVID. And so we, we have uh, Boris Lushniak, who's a uh, uh, former Deputy Surgeon General, talk about COVID-19, gave us an overview of the, uh, of the entire uh, disease and how it caught the world unprepared. And then we talked about uh, uh, the hot zones, New York City, uh, Italy. And we have authors talking about uh, how they coped with uh, the COVID, uh, especially in those early uh, months uh, when it was ravaging uh, those two areas. Uh, finally, in innovative uh, research, <clears throat> uh, we talked about uh, surgical ethics of surgical, of surgical trials, uh, introducing new techniques. Again, Alex Langerman contributed that. A very nice chapter on uterine transplant by uh, Angie Wall, and then uh, talked about uh, a very uh, innovative and uh, experimental treatment for prostate cancer. Uh, that's limited by uh, the ability to pay. So, uh, again, an, an ethical dilemma. Next slide, please. So uh, we uh, we started off at the at the meeting. Um, uh, we sent out the letters. We got uh, a lot of interest from our fellow surgeons. Uh, and in, in April, we got a, a formal. Uh, contract from Springer uh, after we submitted our topics uh, that we uh, were going to prepare. Uh, we sent out uh, the official letters to the authors. They contributed. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, we had certain deadlines uh, and, you know, deadline is only good for a short while and it keeps getting extended. At any rate, we finally put it together and it was due to come out this week, but uh, due to some technical glitches at Springer, uh, it'll be out in February. Uh, so we look forward to uh, uh, <clears throat> to uh, presenting this book to the uh, community, and I hope that uh, we find uh, interest uh, amongst our members. Next slide. We have uh, uh, over 730 pages. Uh, 39 out of the 51 chapters are written by 37 McLean surgeons and fellows, and 12 are written by invited experts in their field. Next slide. We talked about some of the several chapters uh, that, um, uh, that are included in the book. Uh, and finally, and Peter, I want you to join in on this. Next slide. Uh, so we, author, we editors are dedicating this book to Mark and Anna Siegler. Your guidance of hundreds of clinical ethical fellows through their time at the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics and your collective enthusiasm, warmth, and dedication to the study of clinical medical ethics have inspired this book. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fasil. I think that um, that uh, very uh, last slide is perhaps the most important one of uh, everything that you said. Uh, and so uh, 
uh, we, we do want to end um, the panel with uh, those special thanks uh, to uh, Mark and Anna. Um, we do have now time uh, for a little bit of question and answer, uh, and there have been a number of uh, questions that have been raised um, by the uh, by the participants, and so I'm going to uh, go ahead and try to uh, ask uh, a few questions of the panelists. And um, if you would like, you know, it's a little bit difficult in this environment for us to engage in a conversation without all talking at the same time. So I'll try to ask people for comments. Um, but if you would like to make a comment uh, about something that someone else is saying, please, you know, signal to me, wave, and then I'll be sure to call on you so that we can be uh, sure that we have a little bit of conversation. Um, so, uh, Let's uh, start with, uh, and, and I, I hope I don't offend anyone, we're going to use first names for the panel, okay? So it's late in the day, it's a Saturday, we're going to use first names. So, uh, so, as, so as not to offend anyone, everyone gets their first name. So uh, Julie, um, somebody asked a question of whether um, separate consent was obtained for prostate exams under anesthesia by urology. And that was answered uh, by Dr. Park Modi, who said no, uh, at least, you know, not routinely um, here. So I guess my question for you, based on that uh, interaction, is in what ways do you see pelvic exams as different and perhaps um, requiring a separate informed consent? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so I do think that that pelvic exams fit under the larger rubric of intimate exams. And I was actually communicating with Lori Bruce um, from Yale about this and kind of the, the larger topic of intimate exams. Um, you know, I will say that I think if we ask patients, um, and in fact, when you do ask patients, um, many do perceive the pelvic examination as being distinct from other exams. Um, now, I, I do also think that um, there should be more explicit conversation around other intimate exams. Um, but my focus is really, you know, I, I don't do any work around prostates. Um, uh, so clearly my work is really focused on the pelvic examination. Um, but, um, I guess my answer to that question is ask the patients and patients very much feel that this examination is distinct from other examinations that are out there. Thank you very much. Um, so, so I've got a question uh, for Norm um, and uh, uh, this was uh, asked very nicely. I'm going to paraphrase. Um, how can a patient develop trust in a surgeon whose philosophy or worldview um, is significantly different from the surgeon? Um, yeah, th thank you for that question. I, I guess my, my fundamental answer would be I, I don't think that should matter. Um, that the surgeon-patient relationship, the doctor-patient relationship should not be limited or encumbered by a worldview difference or, frankly, any other individual characteristics of, of, of the surgeon or, or the patient. Um, you know, I'd be interested maybe in a fleshing that out maybe a, a little bit more so I understand it. Uh, or making sure that I am understanding it, but I would I would say I don't think it should matter what the worldview is. Thanks. Uh, uh, you know, I'm uh, since there's a lot of questions and uh, there's a lot of panelists, I, I I'm going to go on then to um, ask uh, uh, Megan. Um, a couple people asked about some nuts and bolts about the study that you uh, have done of the third year students and their reflections on the uh, ethical issues. And so uh, a couple of them were 
uh, and I'll, I'll just ask them together and let you uh, answer them all at once. Um, first of all, did students consent to participate? Could they opt out? Uh, and uh, do you share their reflections, if you know, positive or negative, with the uh, faculty and residents? Um, we were exempt from the IRB for um, the need to get a consent. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, we anonymize all of the data, um, so we don't know who submitted it. We don't know, uh, we know the rotation that they were on, but we don't know anything else about um, the individual person. Uh, we don't know anything about the services that they were on in particular within um, that rotation. Um, so it's all anonymized data, um, and so they don't need to consent for it. Um, what was the second part of that question? I'm so sorry. Oh, could they opt out? Could no. the students opt out? No. So it's, I mean, the, the, the whole longitudinal curriculum is a mandatory class. It's mandatory attendance in person when it's in person or remotely when it's remote. So it's not like other courses where they can watch the recordings if, if they want to, or just read about it in the book if they want to. The, the whole four years is a mandatory course. And so uh, they do need to submit vignettes and they do need to submit the surveys that accompany the vignettes uh, for each one. Got it. Thank you. Um, so uh, Gina, I've got a question for you. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it, it is, I guess I'll ask two of them together. Um, uh, someone asked, will the ECMO patient without insurance be able to be on a transplant list in their country of origin? And then, uh, in addition, I guess I would ask the more general question, is there any screening of eligibility for transplant prior to putting someone on ECMO or is or is, are these completely separate and independent discussions, do you think? Yeah, I think like with the time, like how urgent these patients, especially with COVID pneumonia, were placed on it, I think there's not enough time to talk about that beforehand for many of the patients, so that's an issue. Um, I was just Googling before this, um, so uh, multiple of the patients that I'm aware of across the country, um, they were of Mexican origin, and just looking that up, um, there's one, per this, article I found, there's one active transplant center in Mexico, and they did shut down for a bit because of the COVID pandemic. And so for her, that um, for the patients that I'm aware of, that likely wouldn't have been an option to send them back home. Um, so I think, there, ideally, there's a lot of things that we should ask up front about um, in the informed consent process, but I think a lot of it we don't have time to, or the patient can't consent themselves because they're not awake or alert. Thank you. Um, definitely a, a challenging group of uh, patients without question. Um, so I, I'm going to ask the, the next question of um, uh, Alex first, and then uh, I'll ask uh, Norm for you to, to weigh in afterwards. Um, so uh, Alex, to what extent do you believe that uh, full explanation of trainee involvement uh, might uh, significantly cause a decrease in the trust that the patients place in their surgeons? Well, you know, uh, I think, I don't think that that, that would be the case. Uh, I do think that a, um, that it may make the patients more worried or more concerned about the training involvement. I think there's a potential for that. I think that is the challenge that, that you face. And I suppose there's a, an element of if a patient were to, refuse training involvement, which is a, a subtopic, you know, worth more conversation, but something that we've studied, uh, how surgeons respond to that. You know, I mean, if you're like, well, you know, forget you, like, get out of here. I mean, that, that, that wouldn't engender a lot of trust, of course, versus, um, you know, a, a discussion about the reasons why trainings are important or, or other, or you, you know, you can't do the surgery without the training, other things that hopefully would build some trust. So I actually don't think that an explicit discussion would harm trust specifically. And in fact, I think it bolsters trust because the more open and transparent you are in communication, the, the, there's no sense that you're hiding something. Now, what really damages trust, and we saw this with the overlapping surgery, you know, sort of um, uh, uh, expose in the Boston Globe and why the patients were off, were very upset, the ones that they interviewed, and was that, that they didn't know that that was happening versus, you know, a situation where you might tell a patient ahead of time an uncomfortable truth about, well, you know, this is kind of how we logistically make it happen. And this is something I, I do practice 
what I preach. I talk to my patients about trainees and, and when I'm overlapping, I talk to them about that. Um, and I, I don't think that that's anything that they're like, yeah, yeah, you know, that's what they really want. But at the same time, I, I think that they appreciate that I am being forthcoming with them. And the, the, the thing I'd really not want to do is to have that be a situation that they don't know about. And then after the fact, be like, uh, you know, hey, I, I never really told you about this, but this, this, you know, this was kind of how your surgery was conducted. I think that's the real undermining of trust. Thanks, Norm. Thoughts? Yeah, uh, great, uh, great question. And I think, um, or I know Alex is helping us all learn about this through his research. I didn't mention, we, we published an additional thematic analysis uh, study, which was around the, the question of trust in trainees. And uh, three themes uh, came out from that, which were that uh, trust in trainees was bounded by what the trainee would do, uh, trust in the attending surgeon, and institutional trust. So those were the three themes that came through when we queried uh, patients or in, in interviews where they discuss trust in trainees. Um, I, um, I, I do uh, believe in the, the obligation to, uh, to discuss the roles that uh, trainees are going to have in surgery. And I would advocate for, you know, it, it informed by knowing that interpersonal relationship is an important part of developing trust in the attending surgeon, I would advocate for us making a point of discussing our, our training programs when we're consenting patients for surgery. On the morning of surgery, right, it's often a, a, a team that patient has not met before uh, and that the attending should introduce if possible, you know, together with them, or if not, when the attending's talking to the patient uh, ahead of time, uh, mention who's gonna be there, uh, you know, what what their uh, what what role they play in the team, and then you know as far as you know deciding what what nuts and bolts as for who will do what, I think there probably is a level of too much information. But I will say I will be teaching throughout the operation. Throughout the operation, I am there either guiding the hands or working together with one of our trainees, or I'm doing things with my own hands with them observing. But I'll be teaching throughout the operation. So the answering the question, I, I don't I don't think so. And also I think we have an obligation to talk about it. And so if it does undermine trust, we need to figure out how to do a better job. Thanks, Norm. Um, Julia, I can't help but uh, reflect on the parallels between this question of, you know, should we talk about the extent to which uh, trainees are involved? you know, as Alex pointed out, somewhat of an uncomfortable position uh, to have that discussion. And yet, um, you know, pelvic exams under anesthesia, certainly something that I think in the past, many people would have preferred to not discuss. So can you, you know, reflect on what, um, you know, what, what your study has, uh, has taught us and, you know, how we might approach these things like discussing trainee involvement? Yeah, I mean, I think that my goal, um, I was so eager to do a chart review um, to show the prevalence of accepting a pelvic examination under anesthesia with trainees because just in my everyday conversations with patients, um, I felt confident that having an open discussion about this, um, patients for the most part would be accepting. Um, and the idea of not having a discussion because you're afraid that a patient would say, no, I don't want the trainee involved in this part of care, to me was so abhorrent because that meant that people would be then doing this procedure, doing this the examination under anesthesia without having asked that question, knowing that a certain percentage of people would not want that trainee involved. Um, and so my, my goal, my primary goal, if nothing else, with the chart review was just to show people that the vast majority of our patients are fully accepting of having trainees involved. Um, and these conversations actually are not that hard. 
Um, that's something that came out of the interviews with um, residents, fellows, and attendings. Um, they're really not that hard. And when you explain to patients the importance of um, uh, incorporating trainees in this part of the procedure, um, again, patients are, are very welcoming of this. So, um, you know, this is a very focused procedure, um, but I would say that um, it can be a very, you know, I think daunting discussion um, at the outset but in reality, um, it seems to engender trust and um, I think makes it a much more positive experience for patients and uh, physicians and trainees in particular. Thank you. Um, so, uh, let me... Oh, I heard some uh, interference. Sorry, I thought someone wanted to make a comment. Uh, Megan, let me ask you, um, Given, I was a little bit uh, disturbed by the fact that uh, if I understood your data correctly, there's a higher level of moral distress by uh, students on surgical rotation than on other rotations. Uh, and so is there uh, a plan to change the surgical curriculum in any way or counsel surgeons on uh, you know, how to minimize the moral distress? I think you're muted. I'm not. It's okay. Sorry. Um, I think I'm okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, one of the things uh, when I'm trying to figure out so how the differences between the medical rotations and the surgical rotations is um, maybe FaceTime with attendings might make a big difference in order to be able to um, sort of have uh, the capability to ask these difficult questions or to, to raise concerns or to say, this was hard to work through. Can can we talk about it? And I don't know if it's because we don't have dedicated sit down time with the medical students, um, or if we seem unapproachable, um, or always angry, throwing things, you know, our reputation, uh, raging. <laughs> but um, but but really, truly, I do think that it's just going to become. Um, a more natural sort of um, uh, discussion to have once we recognize that it helps medical students work through these problems, that it decreases um, sort of their uh, decreasing quality of life. So, so rather it improves their quality of life through medical school, it, it, it decreases the decline in empathy. Um, if we can prove that that happens, which I think we're hopefully in the early stages of looking into trying to, to prove, um, maybe it's just enough that we talk about the problems, that we talk about these sort of value-laden um, situations that students find themselves in, which, which beforehand were just sort of possibilities, that were just lectures, that were just small group discussions based on a case study, right? And now they're very, very physically and personally involved with these patients. Um, you know, one other thing is that when, when patients and um, when uh, students are thrown into surgical rotations, it's frequently a very fast paced environment. So if you see the number one reason why they didn't report their, their distress to their mentors, the number one reason is that they didn't have time. Um, and I think that this is really, um, this is really telling. And it's probably also partly due to the fact that their residents were most frequently mentors who also don't have time. Um, so I guess that's my best, my best answer to that. <laughs> I think we need to, and we need to take our time when we can to recognize that that talking about it is is helpful, that matters. Thanks, probably good advice for all of us uh, in multiple circumstances. Uh, Gina, let me, um, let me just uh, read to you one of the questions that was raised and ask you, you know, your thoughts on it as someone who has uh, a lot more expertise in this uh, area. So the question was, I struggle on our ECMO allocation team with how to justly balance an adequate trial given uncertainty versus the large number of patients dying daily on our wait list. Thoughts? Yes. Um, and that is so important. I think the first thing is if we have open circuits somewhere else, we need to get those patients to that other place. You know, I heard in Chicago, a hospital was saying how, well, they're not referring their patients anywhere because no one's accepting. Well, I knew personally internally at Rush, they were accepting. So we have no institution like we have no organizational structure to allocate open circuits to people who are in need. So that's number one is just get the circuits. Like if someone's in need, get them to the right place. But then if we truly do need to allocate, like what timeline, I think it's going to depend on patient diagnosis. All these diagnoses 
that patients are put on ECMO for, they're going to have a different likelihood of getting off. You know, there is some data, like after 30, 40 days, the mortality rate starts to plateau. So could that be considered? That's one idea. But then you hear these stories about like people being on it nine months that are finally liberated and now living on their own. So I think it's going to be like kind of a, a very big discussion, but like some triage committee is going to need to be involved in that um, in, 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 you know, conjunction with the, the primary doctors, but the triage team will have to make that ultimate decision. And the timeline, I think it's going to have to depend on patient diagnosis. And I don't know if we're ever going to be able to come up with the true number. It's, it's always going to be subjective. Very good. Thank you. Um, well, I do want to thank you all very much for your uh, outstanding uh, participation, your presentations. Uh, very, very thought-provoking. Um, it's time now for us to uh, turn things back over to our fearless leader, Dr. Mark Siegler. Good afternoon. I, I just wanted to tell you how delighted and honored I am that so many of you have attended uh, the, this conference of the McLean Center. Uh, as you know, it's the 33rd annual conference. Um, and um, it's, uh, in a way, the most exciting one of all. Um, I, I, I very much loved uh, Dean Polanski's introduction of Dr. Bernard Lowe, and, um, and it was a spectacular uh, review of, of Dr. Lowe's work, and then Dr. Lowe's superb talk uh, for the McLean Prize presentation this year. Um, very, very wonderful and very moving in terms of the, the tradition and background of clinical medical ethics, and also the future of ethics as we go forward uh, uh, medically uh, and, and ethically. Uh, I, I also uh, want to express my, my, my great thanks to the seven moderators uh, who, who were with us um, to yesterday and today. Uh, we started with Dr. Monica Peake, and then we went on to Dr. John Lantos, who is, remember, assisted at the end with uh, Dr. William Parker. And, and then Dr. Emily Landon uh, was the moderator of the third panel, uh, Susan Toll of the fourth panel. And today, uh, Dr. Lainey Ross uh, moderated the first panel on pediatrics family ethics, and um, Lexi Torkey um, moderated the panel six on the field of clinical medical ethics, and Peter Angelos moderated the final panel, number seven, on surgical ethics. Let, let me just extend the idea of the moderators, who are also uh, wonderful, fabulous speakers uh, today. Uh, I, I just want to say that that they were among the 40 people who spoke eloquently and, and profoundly um, on aspects of medicine, medical ethics, clinical medical ethics, and, and the whole range of matters. Uh, I was deeply moved by, by the talks today and, um, uh, I, I just, and yesterday. And, and I just uh, wanted to emphasize my, my delight at, at finding such wonderful talks being presented uh, at this conference. I, I just thought it was outstanding, and I, I want to thank the speakers so much. But I also, while I'm, I'm at this, want to say my dear thanks uh, to the McLean Centers uh, advisors and assistants. Um, Kimberly Connor, who is the administrative director uh, of the McLean Center, uh, has been very important in developing this program, uh, as have been the research assistants um, uh, with Elena Stankaitis, uh, in particular, have also Glennis Harris um, and Renana Dine, and then some of the uh, students who have begun to work with us, Jenna Wong and Juliana Khalil. Um, it's been great to have them with us. Um, 
Let me just conclude by saying that I am indebted tremendously to Barry McLean and the McLean family, which started, as Dean Polonsky said, with Dorothy Jean McLean, Barry's mother, back in the early 1980s. And it's been a very moving experience to work with Dorothy McLean and Barry McLean and all of Barry's family over the years. And then I do want to acknowledge Rachel Kohler, who's been the chair of the board of the McLean Center for the last four or five years. I want to thank Rachel and her husband, Mark Hoplomasian, for their involvement in our progress and work. So with that as my background, I want to thank all of you for being here today, and I especially want to once again acknowledge Bernard Lowe as the winner of this year's McLean Center Prize. Thank you so much.